2016. We welcome you here today. Before we begin, There's I would like to agenda. recognize Mayor Applegarth yeah. from Riverton, who's Mike. visiting with us today. And we're happy to have you with us, Mayor, and extend our invitation for you to join us. And I uh, hope you find that uh, meeting uh, to be worthwhile. I'd also like to recognize Luke Allen, who's worked with us for the last several years and an asset to the <laughs> Equal Commission. This is Luke's last day. Oh. Luke has found better, uh, greater opportunities uh, working with for a family. Uh, I was going to say adventure, but it is a family venture, as I recall, Luke, and we wish you well as you go forward. Thank you for your service to the Utah Lake Commission. Thank you. We'd like to excuse Commissioner Ellerson, Mayor Sheldon Wimmer, Mayor Thompson from Highland, and Mayor Wilson from Lehigh today. They've asked to be excused as they have other matters on their plates this morning. <coughs> on email, we sent out the board minutes for the July 27, 2016 meeting. We need to approve that as a consent agenda. Is there a motion to approve the consent agenda? So moved, so moved by Mayor Curtis. Is there a second? Second. Seconded by Shelley Barts from Saratoga Springs. I'll call for a vote. All in favor say aye. 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 Thank you. The consent agenda is approved. We'd like now to have a report from our technical committee and turn the time over to Mike Mills to report on the technical committee business. Michael. <coughs> Yes, thank you, Mayor. Appreciate the opportunity to be here and just give a brief update from our technical committee. Um, we didn't meet during August, um, but we did have a very lengthy meeting back in July. It was kind of in the midst of the doomsday scenario we had <laughs> transpiring out there with the algal bloom. And it, it was a long meeting. There were some, some discussions, some um, I can't think of the right word. I wanted to say heated, but that That's isn't right quite word. right. That's the right word. Heated discussions <laughs> during our technical committee meeting. It, it, it went probably longer than any of us wanted, but it was very informative <clears throat> and a lot of opinions were expressed. So it was a good meeting. Um, just to update you on a few things that are happening down on the lake. Um, to report on carp removal, um, things have been moving along quite diligently out there. Um, we are now over 22 million pounds removed. Um, since the project started all the way back in 2009. And all year I've been talking about how we're behind where we were last year. This time last year we removed about 3.2 million pounds of carp. And that has been our lowest year in a number of years. And so I've been saying all year you didn't get the fish in January, February wasn't great. So we're kind of behind the eight ball on all of this. Well, the boys have been very diligent and I'm happy to say that they're now up within 100,000 pounds of where we were last year. Whereas back in May, I was talking about 600 to 800,000 pounds behind where we were. So it's been a pretty productive summer. It made up a lot of ground during the time when I typically would tell you that fishing is horrible. And I was telling everybody they'll never catch up until the fall. And it looks like they are getting caught up. So that's good. With a good productive fall, we could see removal totals approaching 4 million pounds for, for this year. So that's encouraging. Um, in terms of Utah Lake research, um, what part of the voice crew has been involved in for the last two weeks has been a carp census project out on the lake. Um, carp removal is still going on. But a portion of the crew has been working with Utah State University and the Division of Wildlife Resources to do, we've been doing this annually. Um, to do a, a census of the population out there and come up with an estimate of the density of carp still in the lake. So we probably won't get those results back until probably October or November. Um, it takes them a while to go through all the data and crunch all the numbers. But we're, <coughs> it's really our main indicator of how well our carp removal program is going. We've removed a lot of pounds, but this tells us that that's really making a difference. And this is kind of being piggybacked on another, another effort through Utah State University, which was kind of a reassessment of the carp populations. We looked at a lot of different population variables, tell us more about what the current carp population looks like compared to um, what it looked like when we started back in 2000. Um, and then there's several other research projects happening down on the lake. Um, the County Health Department and the folks out of Walt Baker's office have of course been very diligent in water quality monitoring and deploying the new state
stations that collect data in real time to help them identify conditions that may lead to algal blooms in the future. Um, so very exciting stuff happening down there, very encouraging. And then the last thing Eric wanted me to talk about was the water situation for the coming year. And this is probably very premature. Um, it's very early to be able to say too much with any definity on what Utah Lake will look like um, in 2017. But the one thing we do know is that the reservoirs upstream from Utah Lake are all in much better condition in terms of their levels um, in comparison to where they were last year. That's encouraging that there's the possibility of more water that could be allowed to come down through the system to reach Utah Lake. I would probably leave that at, at that. And you know, we're here as a technical committee. If the governing board ever has anything we would want us to look <coughs> further into, we are encouraged and happy to do that. So, um, are there any questions? Uh, Just one question, and uh, Mr. Chair, uh, maybe it would be worthwhile uh, for Mike Steiner to come and talk to us about water management. And I know he won't have all the answers there. Maybe the state engineer's office needs to help us understand the filling of the reservoirs above, the restrictions. Uh, uh, and maybe, Robin, you can speak a little to that right now. Um, thank you. It, the, the, the appropriate person would be the state engineer who best understands how to, uh, how to explain the management of those resources and how they come to be what they are. Uh, Director Steiner uh, would be uh, excellent as well. So I guess my question is, uh, the full reservoirs above uh, the restrictions here on Utah Lake, uh, flow levels, what, what are the competing factors, what are the downstream needs? Uh, is Utah Lake at the end of the row relative to which reservoirs gets filled and why, how the decisions are made there? That would be of interest to me. Jim Shockoff could have an awful lot of understanding there as well. I can tell you that uh, this has been an interesting summer. Um, I can also tell you, oh, there's been, there you are. Sorry. Um, <clears throat> there is a very complicated and very detailed process by which the upstream reservoirs are full. They, they at times carry storage that is still subject to call on Utah Lake based on water rights. Water rights in Utah Lake have to be met before upstream storage can occur, and that has happened this year. The Central Utah Project today has about a foot of water in Utah Lake, but for the Central Utah Project, Utah Lake would be a foot lower than it is today. So there is a very complex plan. It is being and has been followed. Uh, the trick is when Mother Nature provides 25% off the Spanish Fork River in the last 10 years, something has something changes and uh, that's part of the elevation of the lake but there there is no water there's not one drop of water being stored upstream that is is not being stored under the priority system of the water right system of the state and so that's what we need to understand uh, Deer Creek and Jordanelle are both subject to making sure water rights are met in Utah Lake before permanent storage can occur there. And uh, every year is different. This year has been drier than most. I think it's been 20 years since we've been in this situation. And so those who are familiar with the lake after 20 years, um, memories are a little foggy, but I can tell you that, uh, that there's an education process every year to go through because things are a little different on the lake. But there is no water in, in the upstream storage that is not stored in priority. Is it possible to take what you just said and give it in a paragraph or two that the public could understand? Mayor Curtis, if, if the general manager of Central Utah could understand something, that would be helpful. <laughs> it is complicated, but I think a statement from the state engineer's office would be the most appropriate because he's the one. Central is, is heavily involved because of how we manage the Central Utah project, but we do not manage the distribution plan, which is actually managed by the state engineer's office. So that would be, I, I think, Robin's spot on. I think, I think the state engineer's office would provide some information that would be accurate and complete, not just uh, 
tip of the iceberg from Central Utah. But well, I'd be happy to coordinate probably we'd be happy to coordinate with this kid to, Absolutely. to get something like that. We've got a <coughs> public relations issue with the public doesn't understand it. We can't we are having a hard time explaining it to them, but um, it is called the obviously the press doesn't understand it. No. I I would be further uh, interested in what flexibility in, exists within the current construct of water rights first in time, first in right, and we're having the same kind of issue on the, uh, the south end of the Jordan River where because of uh, water rights, we don't, we have real oxygen problems in the south end of the Jordan River. And uh, so we're working with water rights holders to see if they're at critical times of the year, there can be a diversion, an increase of water there. Um, it's not a permanent increase by any means, but during those critical times that we could preserve flows that will enhance uh, uh, the habitat in the river. So I'm kind of interested what, if any, flexibilities may exist within the current construct for some tweaking or uh, during the critical time. <coughs> uh, and maybe there, the answer is there is none, but I would be very interested in, in what flexibilities may exist. We can uh, certainly invite the state engineer to come to this to this body, and but as, as to whether or not this body is the, the, the appropriate uh, vehicle to disseminate information uh, that maybe your constituency wants to hear, uh, we're, we're open to any and all avenues to try to help uh, bring clear understanding to the management of water on, on the Provo and Jordan River systems. So, anything that, uh, but if, if that, I know the state engineer would be more than happy to come and address this body. But if, if we need to put something in writing, um, that basically the media and others could, could uh, get their hands on, that might uh, be a different strategy. So. <coughs> I, I can work on, we, so this is recorded, so I can summarize what you said, send it to the state engineer, get a confirmation and tweaking on that, and then have that sent out to this body, and you can share that on social media or however you'd like to do that. It is, it is complex, and if you think that by just a couple of paragraphs you're going to be able to explain the complexity of how this system has morphed over time, it, it will boggle your mind in terms of the priority rights and how all of that sequences. And, and as Gene points out, every year is different. And, and as water users look to the future to plan their water year, some may decide to, to store, some may decide to release. And then there's the complexity of, of the utilization of the water for the June Sector Recovery Program and, and everything else. It, it's all a, a, a large web of, of, of water utilization that. Uh, has served us well over as many years, and uh, as as things get tighter and as things shrink, then uh, those parameters and those those latitudes that might exist become smaller and smaller. So, uh, but it, it is it will take an awful lot of explaining to uh, completely understand how how all of this water work, uh, system works. Mr. Chair, I might just clarify, when we say every year is different, the hydrology is different every year. The water rights aren't different yeah, every year. Yeah, the water rights are different. It's the hydrology. And so with the priority, and, and the, the state of Utah has for over a century concluded that if there is water to be, to be developed, there ought to be uh, an opportunity to develop that. So that means water that may only be available once every five or ten years is already in a priority system. There's water that's only available once every 20 years that's in a priority system. So that's why it, that's why things get tight, particularly when you're in a prolonged drought, is there are water rights that for a number of years have not been satisfied. But the, but the water rights don't change every year, just the hydrology changes every year. And the system is designed to deal with that. We, we can, I'll include a link to the state engineers, is it the water dispersion plan? It's called the Utah Lake Distribution Plan. Distribution plan. 
So I'll include that link as well on top of the short paragraph so if someone wants to really get into the nitty gritty that it's a nice long explanation of how that works that'll keep you somewhat confused. Thank you for that report, Michael. Thank you, Mayor. I'll turn the time over to Eric Ellis and he'll give us the director's report, cover several items, and if you'll also handle our promotions as well while you're there. <coughs> Uh, so, as we've talked already, the, the lake is, is very low right now. Uh, it's lower than it was last year. Yesterday we checked and it's 6.6 .6 feet below compromise, uh, which leaves it... There, there's a few deep spots out there and it's, and it's great right now for non-motorized, but, but there isn't a whole lot of motorized activity taking place on the lake as the, most of the harbors have a hard time launching boats into the harbor itself. Uh, we'll talk a little later about some dredging efforts that we're going to look at for uh, this fall and, and in the near future. Uh, the algae bloom conditions, uh, it appears that we're, we're into actu actual algae bloom season now that we've had our big algae bloom and so uh, the, the reports are changing on the lake. Uh, right now the the county health department has been kind enough to to pinpoint where the where the concentration of problems are and so there's there's a variety of of advisories around the lake there are two two beaches now that have a warning in place which means boat boat access only uh, non you know non swimming uh, and then uh, the two that are actually mostly used Linden and Utah Lake State Park right now are just at the caution, which means that any form of recreation is okay just as long as you avoid uh, scummy areas. And so you just kind of keep your eyes peeled for, for surface scum that, that might be problematic in and of itself. But otherwise, those activities that are taking place down there can continue currently. Uh, but they're seeing algae uh, and certain types of algae spike yet again since since we had saw the, the drop off at the end of the large bloom. Does that sound accurate, Walt? The only thing more complicated than uh, water life seems to be cyanobacteria. So, yeah. Yeah, we'll, we'll focus on the water and we'll focus on that stuff. Yeah, and so, and the, and so they're monitoring both cell counts of, of cyanobacteria, which has the potential to be uh, toxic, and then they're also um, monitoring for the toxins themselves and both of those combined uh, weigh in on on how they post those advisories and and how they move to closure or or back to to full fully open again so uh, it's great that they're doing such a, a vigilant job of doing that monitoring so that we know uh, where people can be and where they ought to avoid it's 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 worked very smoothly even with the large bloom that we've seen uh, Sandy Beach improvements. Do we have a short update on what's happening? We've been working with Forest Fire State Lands. Uh, we, we are in the process of putting a cooperative agreement together. I got that from Ben the other day, so thank you. Um, we are um, looking to try to do some of the improvements this fall uh, as, as crew time becomes available for our, our uh, county road crews. Okay. That's, they're going to do a lot of the, the grading work and, and uh, uh, even guard around things of that nature. I'm hoping to have a fair amount of these improvements done by next spring to where it's, it's usable and hopefully we have a little water there to actually have, yeah. have some playing down there in the water and, and clean water. <laughs> so I, I think it's moving forward well. And Laura, anything you want to add? Um, we've had the UCC crews down there cleaning up the trees along the road and clearing out the, the understory to prevent some of the activity we've had down there. So if you haven't been down there, you see it, you probably wouldn't notice. But if you have been down there and seen it and see it now, it Great, thank you. Uh, we're we're excited about that. It's it's a untapped resource on the lake, a huge sandy beach that has been used by you know a certain small group, but but a large part of the community has avoided it because it's been kind of a, a shady location in that people can disappear down there and stay there for a long time. So so it'll be nice to have that opened up and available for all to use. Is that a good description? Yes. 
Uh, Utah Lake State Park dredging is Jason here. Uh, the, the dredging project is moving ahead slowly but surely. Uh, the expectation is that it will take place throughout the winter months. Uh, the, the low water year is, will actually prove to be very helpful this year for that dredging project because the, the plan is to put a little coffer dam up, up at the end and drain the remainder of the water and get in there with heavy duty machinery on mostly dry land. So that's moving ahead. Uh, JV Engineering is the firm that's working on that project and they've got permits into the Army Corps of Engineers and are waiting for those to be processed now. Uh, the, we, we, the Commission worked with Saratoga Springs and was able to secure some funding through the city and then uh, stack that onto some additional funding to rent some machinery to clear out the canal. There's a, there's a historic canal that kind of goes along the front of a majority of Saratoga Springs and it has been chock full of invasive species, Russian olive, tamarisk, um, and Phragmites. And so that, that has just begun. Uh, they got a little skid steer with a, looks like kind of a mower on the front that can mow down trees, uh, much like they use for pinion and juniper, the bull hogs. And, and they started in there, they, had, they hit a bit of a speed bump, so to speak, with the machine, uh, but they'll be starting that up again here shortly. And in the short period of time that they were on that project, it looked like it was very effective, that, that tool for cleaning that out. So it'll improve the views for, for all of those that are on the edge there and, and also get rid of all those invasives so that they're not continuing to spread on our shore. Uh, Phragmites removal is also uh, getting ready to start up. We're just working to get permission from all the landowners in the two project areas, Provo Bay and Powell Slough. <coughs> this year will be the biggest, as we've talked about before, the biggest project we've done so far on, on the lake as far as uh, shoreland restoration. And so that will, we're expecting that to start up sometime mid-September uh, and excited about that. Uh, our fall fourth grade field trips that take place on the west side of the lake um, to benefit the West, west Alpine School District uh, will be happening again this year, two days uh, in October on the, 13th, on the 12th and 13th, and those will take place at Pelican Bay Marina, and so we're working with Saratoga Springs to get the permits in place for that and look forward to getting lots of applications. Last year it was we got as many applications for the two-day period that we offered as we do normally on our four days uh, for all of the rest of Yucatan County. So we expect something similar. And, That's and geared toward those schools on the west side of the lake, right? Yeah, so that for their busing system. They, they have a separate busing system, and it's, it's been difficult for their, their schools to afford, even with our, our sponsorship, to afford coming all the way around and down to Utah Lake State Park. So... This kind of splits the, the two areas up a little bit better. Uh, I wanted to show you, we were able to uh, find a really good deal working with BYU on getting our website updated. So a few people had mentioned that it looked old and, and not as pretty. This is, we took a few screenshots before we updated it. So here's what it looked like wasn't terrible but it was just a little bit outdated it has kind of a cluster off to the side and just didn't it wasn't very user friendly and so this is what the new one looks like oh, it looks like I need to move this over if it pulls up so the new version is is much more interactive easier to use um, has, if, as we go down on the page, very straightforward uh, for people to kind of understand what we're about. Uh, goes down and talks about what's, what's happening. Uh, much better interaction with the, the blog posts. So we regularly post blogs and up until now they've kind of just, once you get past the first page they disappear and and unless you're really willing to really search, you wouldn't find anything. Now they're much easier to find. We can ha we have our upcoming events posted at, on this portion. 
so things that people might be interested in quickly available to them and then we also have our YouTube channel uh, that people can look at the top ones right now and then go to watch more and see all the rest that with information about Utah Lake so and then at the bottom we can have whatever our, our most uh, the closest activity that's going to happen is a clock on it and and we can have some, let somebody get excited about whatever is happening next. And on this uh, fall field trip with fourth grade employees, I would ask that you have staff prepare a personal letter of invitation to the mayor and city council of uh, Eagle Mountain. They okay. might attend that field trip and let them see what's going on in hopes that we can encourage them to join our organization. It's a great idea. We'll do that. Thank you. So, so that's that. Nice. Um, we're excited to get it done. It was, it was a fun project. We worked with, with BYU has a creative lab for web creation, and they were we had one of their employees come down to the commission to work on it since it's a state-owned page up until we switch it over. So uh, it worked out really nice. Um, we have a couple new employees. Danielle Quist, uh, Noelia left uh, to go out to Kentucky uh, with also a family. The families are stealing away my employees. I wouldn't, wouldn't expect that to be the, the, the big pull. But uh, So we have Danielle Quist is the new executive assistant. Uh, she's not here today. She, she had pre-planned this fun trip to South Africa. Uh, she's an ecologist. And so we're going to take advantage of that. We'll have her put together a lesson plan and probably teach those while, while we're on our fourth grade field trips. Um, she's really excited to, to be connected with something like Utah Lake to, to put some of that knowledge. She's a recent graduate and, and put some of that to use. So we'll take advantage of it as much as we can. And then Sam Breger is replacing Luke Allen. And we're really excited to have him on board. Uh, he's he's going to start out part-time. He's just finishing up at BYU in the Recreation Management Program. Um, just recently finished an internship up in Alaska working with a, a parks program. And so he'll have lots of new ideas on how to use social media and kind of get, get involved that way for the commission. So very excited to have Sam with us. Um, uh, one other big project that we're working on right now is is the Utah Lake Shoreline Trail. Uh, we know that it's a top priority from somewhere around Springville, probably Sandy Beach, up to and including Saratoga Springs to complete that portion. But we're also uh, wanting to keep the long-term vision of having a shoreline trail around the entire lake. So we have worked with uh, Utah County to pull together all of the information that they've had. They did some studies in, back in 09, and, and so we now have a map that shows a, a preliminary trail around the entire lake. We'll, we're going to submit that to the Wasatch Front Regional Council so that they have it in the back of their mind as well. And then... Wasatch Front or to MAG? Both. To Wasatch Front Regional Council because they want to know the entire Wasatch Front. And then to MAG, we're working with, with MAG directly uh, to also implement or put that on their uh, planning maps and I'm going to go with Jim Price and some of our county folks and we're going to go meet with each of the communities around the lake uh, make sure that the alignment of that trail is is set and then we will make that the official uh, proposal for the trail moving forward so those meetings will begin now that we've got our trail delineated to some degree and we're really excited about that. So, I can add just one thing. So, just uh, kind of the, the thought from when the, the trail was, was initially laid out between the River and the Jordan River, all oh, 20 years ago, 25 years ago. The idea was that the, the trail would kind of be that line in the sand, if you will. That that's kind of the end of development, and then you have the lake on the other side of it. Whether it's right at the water's edge, that may not necessarily be the case, but the, that's kind of the end of development. And it may not always hold true, but for the most part, that's that point. A couple of thoughts. Um, have, we, have we found any specifications um, for the trail? Because this is likely to be built in segments 
and if not careful, we'll have a hundred different types of trails. Um, like it'd be nice if we could have a recommended. Do we, have any? We, we do, and, and we've actually been working with the cities as, as cities build different segments of it to try to make sure they're all the same. I guess my second thought is, in a quest to have this be the, the edge between the life and development, we could get hung up in a lot of places. But it seemed to me to be wise to make some compromises. I know one property owner who said, I'll never let you go between me and the beach, but I'll give you the property on the other side of my hand. Okay. And, and that's why I say that it's in general, we want it to be that the end of development, but it may not always be the case. We're, we're more excited to have a lake, a, a trail that surrounds the lake than to necessarily have it just where we want it. So, so the end, the, the, the goal will be to finish the trail, not to have it just exactly like we like it, if that's what you're getting at. Do we have a timeline on, on that trail completion? At least no. even the Springville to Saratoga Springs? Our lifetime. <laughs> I, I will push on it really hard over the next couple of years. Um, we, we've been talking with, we, we met with UDOT to see if they could um, work with us on finding a, one of the larger grants for it, a trail grant, and, and they're willing to help us out on kind of pursuing the stages that we need to get to to apply for that. Mm -hmm. um, but a lot of it will be development-based, uh, at least in the communities that are, that are already annexed into that portion. Uh, the county portions, maybe we can work on on a larger grant to kind of complete those large sections. What is the overall budget for for that trail from Springville to Saratoga? It, I don't know that it has been created. So yeah, we haven't really got into that yet. Okay. Be because it gets broken up in in so many ways. So, um, a lot of the communities have have a development clause when. When a when a developer comes in, they pay for it, and then and then those little gaps we we might have the county or or the city itself cover that little gap that between developments, and so I don't know. And the point of interest, like, we need to look for the ways that we can we can work together with the piece of trail going in Saratoga Springs. Um, it's actually on Forestry Fire and State lands land. Uh, the county acquired the the right away for it several years ago and actually put the, the sub base in. The city's now taking over and, and getting the trail complete and there's actually a meeting later today uh, for, it's not a pre-construction meeting, but a, a pre-bid meeting yeah. on that portion of the trail uh, that will complete the part from the Loch Lomond subdivision over to the Jordan River. Awesome. We'll connect that, that piece. Okay. But you know, look, look for those cooperative efforts like that wherever we can. So will some of the, could some of the conversations with the city be, because I know Spanish Fork City is not really ordered that, but they would be uh, very interested in being able to connect yeah. their plan to, Absolutely. you know, because we're trying to get to Springville and Provo, and this would be a part of that too. So, so the, the grant that, that the commission received from the state through Forestry, Fire, and State Lands last year, uh, part of that went to Spanish Fork City to complete the trail, the community trail system from I-15 out to Sandy Beach. The study of it. The study of it, sorry, the study. <laughs> to, to do the delineation of that. And so that that would then tie in and then we would, we would, that would be your connection down to the lake and that would be very much part of it. Eric, is there a way to um, add that to the website where people could look and see where the plan is and, For sure. and which parts are developed so that they would know where to go and yep, and that's start. And so I, that'll that'll be kind of the culmination of, of the this series of meetings that we're going to take is to uh, not only figure out what the cities have completed, but also figure out what is planned, and then and then tie that all together so that we have a a, a map that we can show publicly without causing some some grief. Right. Um, but yeah, that'll definitely be on the on the site and. Okay as used as a tool so we're just early in the process so. yeah, that's great. Uh, one other quick thing you all notice these little white boxes uh, in front of you this these are just a, a tiny little gift to put up on your shelf to remind you a that we exist the Commission and to, to think of cool projects for down on the lake 
and also to, to as a thank you for your support of the commission. Uh, it's a tiny little a sailboat, so nothing fancy, uh, but it has a little plaque on it that, that with an appreciation for your organization uh, participation on the on the commission. So if you ha if you need any help, all it is is it's you have to stand the sail up and attach a couple little strings. It may take some trial and error. Uh, we might pull Luke off the job from his new job because he assembled one in the office to see if they worked, and they're they're a cool little something. But but it'll it'll be a nice little thing on the shelf that that you can look at and wish you were out on the lake. Uh, moving into promotions, uh, these are a few things that we're going to work on over the next couple months. Uh, Channel 4, uh, working with, who approached us about this? Um, they do, hi they highlight state parks around the state uh, each year, and they approached us to, to highlight Utah Lake State Park and Utah Lake, and we will, they'll put together a couple nice videos on the lake uh, that are prepackaged, and then the day of they'll be down there and do some really cool um, TV interviews with, with their host. And so this is a sponsorship that we do, kind of a pay to play thing, um, but it'll be a great opportunity next spring when the state park has been dredged uh, and there will be a lot more activity open down there regardless of the water year. Uh, they'll have access to the lake much longer into the year than, than we've had in the last couple of years. So, so we're moving ahead with that when that happens next spring. Uh, the Envision Utah Water Innovation Challenge, this is something that um, Council Member Seastrand, Mark Seastrand, uh, works for UVU as his other job and he's in charge of the entrepreneurial program and they're hosting a challenge. Uh, Gene Shawcroft, myself, and, and Orem City will be participating to kind of present some problems that, that are facing Utah Valley as far as water issues. Uh, we'll present the, the Utah Lake portion, and, and then we'll, that'll have the students come back with an with innovation challenge, uh, and they have there will be cash prizes of some some form for them, and they'll come up with a business plan. And so, they they partner their business students with science students, and and kind of pull them all together, and come up with real real life solutions to some of these issues. We're excited to see what it produces. So, so they're teams of students. Teams and then of students. Compete against each other. Yes. So they'll, they'll kind of draw from the discussion uh, what the problems are and, and see if they can come up with some cool solutions for those. And when will they be doing that? That is September 6th. Yeah. And it'll be hosted on UVU campus. Uh, the NASMA is the North American Invasive Species Management Association, a uh, big national organization that's coming to Utah this year. Um, Aaron is is a part of, of drawing them in here, Aaron Eager, with the invasive pro program here in the county. And we're going to have one of the stops, they're going to do a tour, and then they're going to come, as part of that, they'll come down to the lake and see some of the highlights of, of the Phragmites removal that has been done over the years. So we're excited to have them down, that, and we're, we're sponsoring like a lunch or something like that for them. Uh, and just recently we had the um, the paddle race down at the lake, it was quieter than we, it was about as quiet as we expected it to be, but we had a, a pretty decent turnout, uh, and this was just after we got the all clear on the lake, and so there was still, I assume, a lot of hesitation for people to come down, but we had probably 25 racers, and I expect next year's annual race will have triple or more of, the, of that, that group. Uh, the folks that did attend really, really enjoyed it. Uh, they did as long as an eight-mile race all the way out to the middle of the lake and back. Uh, our paddle concessionaire at the last second decided to join them, and he said he was sore for two days. <laughs> and he does it every day, so it was, it was long. But it was fun to watch. Um, yeah, we'll go to there and, and right. 
Luke, do you want to cover with us our sure. communications public relations plan, please? Yeah, so one of the main roles of the outreach coordinator position is to do things that help improve the public perception of Utah Lake. So, uh, unfortunately, with the algae bloom that happened recently, we feel like that perception took kind of a hit. And so we've called together a lot of the PIOs and PR people from um, most of your organizations to kind of help us uh, create a plan to, to continue to improve the perception of Utah Lake. So we've reached out to all of your PIOs, and we've got a good group together that we're going to be meeting with monthly to kind of make a plan uh, and to share ideas on how we can continue to improve the perception of the lake. So um, we are going to hopefully be hosting more events around the lake year-round. That's one of the things we'd like to do. Uh, we have budgeted out each year some event sponsor sponsorship money that we'd like to use a little bit more to host events like at all of the marinas year-round. Um, and as a group, as this PIO group, we're going to work together to coordinate social media campaigns and things like that so that we can be unified in our message and be clear and um, give people the, the reality of Utah Lake, um, both the things it struggles with, but most you know, the positive things, the awesome things, you know, just how close it is to everybody, um, the size of it, you know, the, the privacy you can have when you get out there on the lake on a boat. There's tons of great things about the lake, despite you know, the occasional algae bloom that we'll have. So, uh, that's something that Sam will continue to work on monthly with these PIOs. Uh, it's something that I think will help a lot. Do you have anything to add there? No, just I, w I would suggest that for those communities that, that are neighboring the, the lake shore, as you think of ideas for, for activities and, and brainstorm on, on events to hold and so forth, think of ones that you could host down at the lake. We, we would be happy to, to help with, with those, have to sponsor those, um, and certainly to spread the word on those taking place. Uh, there's a lot of fun activities. There's, there's activities in the winter. We can do some skating type things. Um, and then lots and lots of events that are possible during the summer. So let us know if, if there's any planned and we will do everything we can to kind of help promote those and, and make those successful. Thank you, Luke. Remind everybody that our next meeting is November 17th in this building, 7.30 a.m. We have published the agenda for the coming year in 2017. It will be March 23rd, June 22nd, September 28th, and November the 16th. Those will be our four quarterly meetings for 2017. I'd like now to go around the room and ask the members of the board if they have anything else to add to today's meeting. Richard? Walter. Just a couple of things that may be of interest to the board. First, uh, the deployment of these data songs or these meters to help us hopefully predict that uh, when we may have uh, algal blooms. Uh, we got funding from the Water Quality Board back in May to purchase those. They've arrived. We're calibrating those now. Anticipate those will be deployed at three locations in the lake next week. Uh, I think. Uh, the Tribune wants to do uh, an article on that, so there will be some media information on that. As well, we'll have other songs that are not as sophisticated as these. These three that we will deploy will be able to give us real-time data. So they'll, they'll download that data directly to our computer. So it's a Wi-Fi enabled that we'll be able to have uh, data, we won't have to row a boat out there and extract it, and so it will be very, very good. Uh, in addition, we are getting three additional SONs uh, through an EPA grant that we'll deploy in other places throughout the state. Uh, Payson Lake has been having some difficulties, Schofield Reservoir, uh, Farmington Bay with algal blooms, and we'll be able to deploy those, Pineview, to be a predictor of uh, you know, some of these blooms. Um, in, in addition, uh, the, the Water Quality Board yesterday authorized a million dollars uh, of funding to go to investigation work that is specific to Utah Lake. Uh, it will be a continuation of the effort that we started in 2015 uh, with stakeholders uh, to look at the lake and uh, determine if uh, nutrient criteria are appropriate to protect that lake, specific nutrient criteria for Utah Lake. So uh, we're completing in 2016 the phase one study. This will be 
uh, data collection, uh, assessment of the beneficial uses, of what are the appropriate uses we're trying to protect in Utah Lake, uh, uh, as well uh, a model so that we know the, the cycling of nutrients. There's a lot of nutrients that are deposited phosphorus in the lake itself. And so there is internal cycling of that that will be a contributing factor to these algal blooms, we believe. We need to understand that better. The University of Utah is helping us out with that modeling effort. Um, the phase two study is it will build upon that. And uh, uh, that's what we will use the, the million dollars for over the course of the next four years. Uh, that is not going to be enough for us to get all the answers, but it will be uh, a great assistance to us to better understand what's going on. Um, part of that will be quarry, to understand historically what are the levels of nutrients in the lake. Is this a natural condition that we're just going to have to live with this and there's no control mechanism that we can uh, implement to prevent it? And to understand what control mechanisms are. Uh, what, what, how many arrows do we have in our quiver? Uh, we've been, uh, as Jeff Foster Miller presented at the last uh, commission meeting, a lot of folks have the answer. Uh, and we've entertained a lot of phone calls on the answer. Chemical addition uh, seems to be the principal uh, one. Is that a viable control mechanism when we have these acute events or not? We need to understand that better. And, um, and a load analysis so that we know what's coming in from all the various sources. Wet weather, dry weather, and even air deposition of nutrients into the lake. Uh, so anyway, that's just an FYI. Um, the Tibble Fork Reservoir has kind of been in the news here recently. I can give you a thumbnail, a sketch of what's going on. None of that water right now reaches Utah Lake. It's diverted to uh, in four diversions. Uh, uh, to communities and irrigation systems, but uh, if you're interested, I can give you what's going on there. Yep. Maybe I'll continue. <laughs> um, the Tibble Fork Reservoir is being refurbished uh, for two principal reasons. One, to raise the elevation 14 feet so that there's increased storage. Uh, it has become, over the last, I don't know, 50 years or so, silted in and there's very little storage in that reservoir uh, with the right now with the 20 second feet of water coming in uh, it fills that reservoir in a little over a day and a half uh, and so they're raising it 14 feet and 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 you know effectively i su i suspect that will restore the original capacity and expand it certainly expand it from what we're experiencing today uh, as in, in addition, the dam safety folks uh, with um, uh, the DNR, they are refurbishing, monies are going towards the refurbishment of that dam. The spillway, it's not up to, uh, uh, it, it's not up to snuff relative to what, the, what it should be today. So those are the two aspects of this. The work uh, began this summer, it will continue uh, into December, early December when it's the, the, the substantial completion date. They had to draw all the water out of that uh, lake, and they did so, but they, there, again, is 20 second feet coming in from the North Fork of uh, uh, the American Fork uh, Creek coming in there. And uh, that water's got to pass through. And uh, because of all the siltation, when they opened the gate that is buried under 14 feet of silt, uh, they got a lot more silt loading than I believe they anticipated. If you've seen some of the video on this, it looks like a mudslide uh, coming down. The uh, lower two miles below the dam, uh, they killed all the fish there, all the trout there. Uh, the, the other six miles below that, there are trout uh, there, the macroinvertebrates, the food source has been affected. There's great amount of siltation, and that siltation continues. It is abated now somewhat, but we continue to cut with the water coming through the reservoir, continue to cut and erode uh, that sediment, and it's depositing it. The concern is what are the metals content, uh, in, uh, particularly lead and cadmium. Uh, so we took, we, we were notified of this event on uh, uh, Tuesday morning. We mobilized folks to go up there and begin sampling. <coughs> 
samples, the preliminary samples will be back from the first day of monitoring today. We took other samples yesterday, they'll be back tomorrow. So we'll, we'll build a where are we in a getting better or not getting better situation. Um, to mitigate this, there was a meeting yesterday of all the principal agencies and those involved, course engineers, uh, at the U.S. Department of Agriculture, the Forest Service, uh, uh, Park Service, uh, the owner of the reservoir, the Conservancy District, uh, the engineer, all to determine what the immediate steps we could take to mitigate the amount of siltation that is going on. It is still going on, but it is not as uh, um, as extreme as it was in, in over the weekend. Uh, there will be a channel built around uh, the north side of uh, the uh, body of the reservoir and north fork of the American Fork River will be diverted to that channel so that it's not cutting right down the middle of the sediment. We'll track that along one side at a very uh, shallow slope so that some of that sediment can precipitate out and uh, we'll direct it around there and I think it'll greatly improve uh, the siltation problem that's going on. It'll probably take four days to construct that. They'll work 24 hours a day uh, until they get that. They'll work throughout the night. So uh, we hope to see some improvement. Um, and so that's that's the report of where things are on, on what you've seen in the media. How long will it take to rinse the stream bed below the dam? Well, that, that is not, I, we don't know yet, Eric. Uh, that's not the focus right now. The, fo the focus is stop the bleeding. Yeah. <laughs> and, that, and we'll have to sit back and see uh, what, um, what are the tools available to flush out, flush that system, because that siltation is extending all the way down, uh, you know, beyond the mouth of the canyon and into the systems. Uh, um, and it's evident, it's being deposited. Um, the question is, you know, two problems right now. First, uh, the acute problem of killing fish because it's uh, they can't breathe. So that's what the, the cause of the, and I don't even know the magnitude of the number of fish, but there were no fish in, the, in that two mile reach. And uh, then the long term chronic uh, issues relative to screening values for using that water for agriculture, uh, uh, you know, the public, are there metals, dissolved metals in there, which would be the most deleterious uh, for the fish, uh, but uh, is there a public, is there an issue of public uh, protection that is involved? And we don't know the answer to that. We know the screening levels we'll be looking at and we'll start having information on that. I suspect we'll have a, uh, some kind of press release on, on that. NRCS, the Federal Department of Agriculture, owns this. And so they're, they're the keepers of all the information. We'll feed information to them. Uh, they will put it on their website because there's so many agencies and interested people involved. Trout Unlimited, very concerned about what's happened. Um, Are the trout stocked in there? Pardon me? Are the trout stocked? Yeah, uh, I don't know to what extent, but yes. So presumably that can just be restocked? Yeah, yeah. That's good. So that's what I know thus far. Thanks for that report, Paul. <clears throat> Mr. Shawcroft, anything from your department? <clears throat> I would just mention that uh, just recently, the June Chuck Recovery Program and the Springville City have, have started a little project um, restoring the, the uh, Hobble Creek River, Hobble Creek Stream through a portion of the park. Mike, do you want to mention anything about that? That was, I think that's significant. Yeah, you, you basically covered it, Gene. But they're on the west side of Springville, about 950 west in Springville. Springville has a community park that they've been developing for the last few years. The south boundary of that park is Hobble Creek. Um, two weeks ago, we started a project to restore the river along that park. Um, it ends up being just shy of a mile worth of river length. Um, we're excited about the project, though. It should be a great amenity to the park and also give us some good jute sucker spawning habitat. Um, we're expected probably to have that finished up before the end of the year. Thank you. Right. So. Our division, I, we probably don't take the opportunity enough to just acknowledge the, the partners that help us manage the state sovereign lands. We, we manage the beds and the shorelines of, of this lake and all state sovereign lands. And I hate to think where we would be without everybody here that's, that assists us with that. Um, we certainly don't have the capacity to accomplish 
even a minor part of what this group does. So Eric and Luke, I, I hate to see you go. You've done, you do a lot of quiet things behind the scenes, and boy, you've been a big help. So I, I, I think that's it from us. We, we're, we're, we're doing our best to, to keep up our end of the bargain. We've got more staff capacity focused on Utah Lake than we've ever had in the history of the division. Uh, staff that know this lake better than, than we ever have. Laura does a great job. She's hiding back there as the Solomon's <laughs> program administrator. But uh, just thank you to everybody that assists us along the way. Thank you, Brian. Mayor Curtis. Robin, I'm the same. Shelly? We have had one project uh, pop up. I'm sure many of you have heard news about uh, our secondary water issues throughout the summer. Um, had a well go down. Um, we are working on engineering for a direct draw from Utah Lake through um, out through the Pelican Marina area and uh, working through the engineering on that right now of course working with all the parties that are um, part of that and we are actually hoping to have that system online um, before next irrigation season. So that's going to be something that we're probably going to have to do a little bit of dredging also in our marina and again the Dryer year will assist with that effort, so it's not a, a big, not a big dredging project, a minor one, but uh, we're looking through that right now, trying to get that done as fast as possible. Anything else? Here? If if you're doing that in the marina, the dredging, uh, there's a motorboat access grant that might be able to help with that. It's through the state. If you dig through your emails from me in the last month, there will be a, all the information you need to know on how to apply for that. Uh, but that would be a great one because if Dual purpose it. Chad? Oh, thanks. Good. Okay. Curry? Anything you'd like to let add, Laura? Nope. I've got a couple of heads being shaken at it, Mike. Anything from the general public? Raise your hand and state, state your name, sir. My name is Elliot Mott. Your comment, sir. Thank you. I'm a volunteer organizer. I lead different outdoor activities. One of the things I like to do is uh, float rivers. And earlier in the year, we uh, did 17 foot floats on the George River. As you know, that leaves uh, Utah Lake and goes north. Uh, we're out now on the Bear River in Cache, uh, Cache County. But I want to talk about the uh, Jordan River relative to Utah County. We would love to have a takeout as far north as possible. County. Right now we can take out at Willow Park and we can take out at 1500 North. There is a wonderful access point at Indian Ford, but it's private property and it's gated most of the time and we can't get to it. It actually has the second, there's only two concrete ramps on the entire river. One is here at Indian Ford, the other one is in Salt Lake City on 1700 South. We would love to have access on the river as far north as possible in Utah County. Is a recreation access point. So that's my that's my request. We'd love to have that. Thank you. Comments from the chair. Walter, you made some comments about Schofield Reservoir in it. I thought I knew all about algae blooming and loading and what it costs and phosphorus and nitrogen and things and Schofield doesn't make any make any sense to me at all because unless it's coming from coal, you know, the algae bloom from coal, I don't see any reason that it would do it because it's all fresh water. So it's just hard to understand. Yeah, we yeah, we do need to understand it better. I mean, uh, we've we've had uh, up in uh, you know, the shadows of the Uinta Mountains on a reservoir up in Duchesne County where there is no industry. There is yes. no on-site systems only jackrabbits and cows had a harmful algal bloom there twice uh, back in 2004-2005 uh, killed a number of cattle uh, and so this, the, this these toxins can appear uh, there the source would have had to have been agriculture and some kind of runoff some kind of contamination of the food source if you will for that because mm -hmm. there's not an explanation uh, we need to understand the Schofield uh, bloom. They do have some on-site systems that could perhaps be feeding into that. Uh, that that uh, area was sewered uh, uh, about three decades ago, but there are still some uh, on-site systems that, that could contribute to that. Agriculture could. It's certainly not uh, uh, 
municipal stormwater or municipal wastewater that's causing that. We need to understand that better, as well as pay some lights. Um, if I had the answers, Mayor, I, uh, <laughs> you could I would much be doing this job. I'd, be, I'd have the Nobel answers. Peace Prize. If people think this is just a local problem, they're not, because there's algae blooms on the Great Lakes, there's algae blooms in the Pacific Northwest, Oregon and Washington, where it's, you know, a pristine mountain, a resort area, and uh, again, the algae bloom occurs for a number of reasons, but it's just all not the gray water that we put into the lake. It's high in the phosphates because of the, the detergents we use, or the nitrates that come from the fertilizers the farmers are spreading on the fields and wash off when the rain comes. And there's a lot of things that fall into it. Temperature, the lack of uh, wind on Utah Lake during those six weeks period that we had the algae bloom. It doesn't move the water, stir it up, and there's a lot of things that adds that algae bloom. Mayor, could I just add one other thing? I think we need to distinguish, however, between uh, algae blooms. We have algae blooms, uh, green algae, if you will. The, the, the uh, genre of algae that we're talking about here is blue-green algae, and there needs to be a big distinction between uh, the two. They are different. Uh, one is uh, the, the, you know, it's, uh, the cyanobacteria is a bacteria. It is a multi-cell organism, uh, blue-green or green algae, which is normal as a single cell, but they act very similar. Uh, the blue-green algae gets its name because of uh, the, the uh, cyanobacteria, that color that it has. It kind of looks like radiator fluid, if you will. So that is the bad stuff. Uh, that is the toxin-producing stuff. And not all of them produce toxins, some do. And, and so it's to understand that particular genre as opposed to naturally occurring, we've always had it type of uh, algal blooms. Okay. Remind everybody again that our next meeting in this room, November 17th at 7.30 a.m. Thank you for attendance today. We will stand adjourned. The next meeting will actually be in the ballroom. This room got was booked, so I apologize. <laughs> ballroom? We'll make that clear. It's in the ballroom that we that we previously would. I'll come here. Yeah. Okay. And we'll all come here. <laughs> yeah. Thank you.